We come now to the 22nd study period here at the British Columbian Camp 1984. This is the 10 o'clock session on the 29th, Wednesday morning. Now we arrived at our rehearsal of the history of this movement at the point where we had learned that vital lesson so far as organisation was concerned back in 1966. And eight years were to go by, during which time the work developed here in, in, in America, in Canada, in New Zealand and Australia, in Africa, in Europe, and uh, outposts began to form in such places as India, later in Hong Kong and Japan, and then in Colombia and Brazil and South America. So without question, the truth today is established in every continent upon the face of the globe, and remarkably has penetrated very strongly behind the Iron Curtain into Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland and East Germany. I have heard reports which I can't verify that uh, books have gone indeed into Russia as well but I can't verify that. But I do know it's very well established in Romania and Czechoslovakia because Andreas, well Wolfgang Meyer first of all and Andreas in turn have uh, visited those countries and been with believers in those various, in various lands. I might uh, just remark too that um, the actual Seventh-day Adventist Church itself in those countries is a state church. And by state church I mean it's um, run, run by the government at, at, according to government uh, permissions. The members pay their tithe to the government just as they pay taxes and the government uses their money to pay ministers of their own appointment to preach what the government says they can preach in those church organisations in, in uh, Romania and Czechoslovakia and East Germany and so on. So when the Adventist people tell you that their churches are prospering in those countries, remember it's under those conditions, not under true freedom. Now our believers of course are totally separated from the state and it's amazing how God protects our believers even though they illegally worship from Sabbath to Sabbath. Now coming back then to the point I was making in regard to true church organisation in which we recognise Christ as being the only head of the church that's a very serious Babylonian principle for men to rule over men in the place of God that the um, illustration given by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 of a human body in which there's one head of many members was to be practically implemented amongst the people of God so that no man ever told any other man what to do that each person refers to Jesus Christ and him alone there are those of course who regard this as being the basis for disunity and uh, confliction of uh, effort and duplication of and duplication of expenditure and that of course is entirely true if there is no living connection between the head and the members but if there's a living connection between the head and the members then it is not possible for there to be disunity. Look at your own body for instance and uh, you have many members, fingers, toes, hands, eyes, heart, stomach and all the various organs of your body and uh, when there is a living connection between the head and each of your body members then don't you find perfect coordination. The arms and the legs all move in correct rhythm the heart does its work and so forth and so on throughout the entire body and in a church organisation where each member has a personal living connection with the divine head Jesus Christ there can only be perfect unity of effort, perfect coordination of all the resources of every member in the church. <coughs> it is argued by some that the Seventh-day Adventist church organisation organised in 1863 because they become too big to remain any longer as a disorganized body. Now first of all they were not a disorganized body. Secondly the church was much larger numbering 50,000 members between August and October 1844 than it was in 1863 when they did organize. The real reason for organization is laid out in Testaments to Ministers page 24. Now, I'd like to read that statement and turn it um, in the opposite direction from which it is generally incorrectly used. <clears throat> Page 24 in the book um, Testaments to Ministers, the first paragraph reads as follows and this was written by the way in about 1903 I believe I just can't get a date here quickly but I'm sure it was 1903 and Sister Wise says it is nearly 40 years 
since organization was introduced amongst us as a people um, that takes us back to 19, 1863 it was I was one of the number who had an experience in establishing from the first I know the difficulties that had been met the evils which it was designed to correct and I watched its influence in connection with the growth of the cause at an early stage in the work God gave a special light upon this point and this light together with the lessons that experience has taught us should be carefully considered now what most folk read in this statement is the fact that Sister White herself led out in this church organizational structure in the year 1863 what they and therefore they conclude that this was entirely God's will for the Seventh-day Adventist Church what is overlooked is this they overlook the little sense which says the evils which it was designed to correct now then <clears throat> obviously these evils were present in 1863 but not present back in 1844 or 1840 or 1836 or 1833 <clears throat> in other words for 30 solid years the church was organized without this kind of organizational structure and but if those evils had been present uh, 10 years before or 20 years before or 15 years before then what, what, what would have been necessary this kind of organization to correct those evils now what were those evils by 1863 as we learned earlier in this week the Seventh-day Adventist Church had become Laodicean they had been Laodicean for at least four years by that time now do Laodiceans have a living connection with their head they don't therefore can the organizational system to which Paul makes reference in 1st Corinthians 12 operate when there is no living head to the organization no hope there is no way in which a, a Laodicean a uh, church can operate according to divine principles of organization that's impossible because they don't have the living head there's no gold no white rabbit no eye cell no connection with their savior now when you have a headless body and the body still has some life in it have you ever back in your heathen days been given the task of chopping the, the, the rooster's head off for Sunday dinner yeah. and let it go <laughs> charges all over the yard flapping its wings falling and getting up again and for a few minutes until life finally peters out completely so it is possible to have a living headless body living in a certain sense of the word and um, the Laodicean church having become headless then of course became disorganized or be was threatened to become disorganized to, to lose its coordination and another head had to take the place of the living head and this of course had to be human heads that is responsible human heads to take the place of the divine head even though of course very inadequately now however this was God's last resort because before the church finally became headless altogether the Lord tried very hard for the spirit of prophecy to bring them back into a working relationship with him and you only have to read the testimonies written between about 1856 or even earlier than that no, I think 1856 I began to 1859 those chapters called Thy Brothers Keeper the Rich Young Ruler Young Sabbath Keepers um, Worldly I've got to have one goes now and then the first uh, presentation of the Sin Message the Shaking Chapter the second presentation of the Sin Message to, sh to see that God tried with all his might and power to reconnect the head with the body he tried very hard to do that and if he'd done that if he'd been successful in doing that then there would have been no need for the organizational structure to come in which did come in <clears throat> but when he failed to do it of course when then of course the evils began to present themselves each man became his own head or tended to become his own head and anarchy and disunion and uh, a lack of coordination began to manifest itself in the church body and the latest sin church would have fallen apart into, into a fragmented ruin if this organizational structure which was brought in in 1863 was not introduced now just like uh, God's command to ancient Israel to take the sword 
And just as God tried in tried unceasingly to take the sword away from them again, so God has been working to bring his people back to the place where they no longer need that kind of organizational structure in which men rule over men in the place of God. Now, very obviously, of course, God's first task is to bring out a body of people who once again have a living connection with the living head and once that has been established, what can we expect God to do about the old organization? Discard it, right? Discard it. And um, this movement, of course, being one in which spiritual connection with Jesus Christ has made the number one priority, the all-consuming priority, this organization which we are most concerned about people having a living connection with their head, Jesus Christ, naturally, therefore, is one in which God has delivered us from that old organizational structure in which men rule over men in the place of God, where decisions are made by committees and boards of management and so forth. And in the same book, page 300, namely Testimonies to Ministers, there is a prophecy written of that day which has now arrived when, once again, God alone should be the head of the work. I read now from page 300 in the book Testimonies to Ministers. Unless those can help in blank, some place not mentioned here, a dash is all we see, are aroused to a sense of their duty, they will not recognize the work of God when the loud cry of the third angel shall be heard. When light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way which would be contrary to any human planning. So by the sure word of God, we ought to know then that there will be no human planning involved at all in the final work. Who alone should be the plan maker? God through Jesus Christ. He and he alone will be the plan maker. And I really love that statement in Christ's topic lesson which says that in the garment of righteousness, and God's work is God's righteousness too, there is not one thread of what? <laughs> human, not one thread of it. Now you think of a garment such as, as is referred to here, a long sleeve garment right down to your ankles, neck to ankle, and quite uh, voluminous, it wasn't uh, a skimpy garment, the garment of righteousness. And would you like to estimate how many single threads are in such a garment? There's probably hundreds of thousands of them. And not one of them, not one tiny thread, maybe half an inch long, and as slender as, as a piece of cotton, is to be of human devising. That's, that's a very um, all-exclusive picture, isn't it, of human devising? A totally exclusive picture. So this statement definitely um, presages a return once again to the original organizational structure in which William Miller operated and to which the Protestant reformers turned as they came out of the Roman system of government. And there is that, uh, can I borrow that lesson of Reformation again? Do you have it handy? Lesson of Reformation? No, don't worry, don't worry. I'll just more or less mention the points. In the wonderful chapter called Reformation Guidance of the Church by A.T. Jones in the book Lesson of the Reformation, he makes the point that every time apostasy came in and the Church of God lost their living connection with the head, in came human election, human voting, and all those things. But every time that a new Reformation was organized by God and they shook off the old darkness and the, the old um, apostasy, they also shook off the human organizational structure and returned to a situation where God alone was the head. Now let me go a little further in this statement in Testament Ministers, page 300. Let me, I'll read this sentence again before I go on. Let me tell you, and that means the sister was very emphatic. She said, this is, I'm really going to let you know this. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those amongst us who will always want to control the work of God to dictate even what movement shall be made. When the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world, God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins in his own hands. The workers will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. 
Those who are counted good workers will need to draw nigh to God, they will need the divine touch, they will need to drink more deeply and continuously at the fountain of living water, in order that they may discern God's work at every point. Workers may make mistakes, but you should give them a chance to correct their errors, give them an opportunity to learn caution by leaving the work in their hands. So then it becomes very clear that the organizational structure involving presidents, committees, boards of management, divisions, unions, conferences, churches and so forth is an interim situation designed to keep the Laodicean church together long enough that it can fulfill its mission to preserve the theory of truth until God could bring out again a living movement and that time of course has presently come. And as I said last night, we, the Lord taught us back in the early 1960s 1966, mid-60s I guess I, better sh I should better say what his kind of organizational structure was and as I said before I plan to learn my lessons only once I don't have to go back and retrace my steps and learn them over and over again and so it was that when in 1974 a man named Charlie Morgan who was the uncle of the young man shot and killed by his mother-in-law whose name was Ken Morgan began to uh, become a cause of concern for us because we saw him literally losing his Christian experience. The joy went out of his life, he began to ask questions that he ought not to be asking, he began to express doubts, at first he realised he was slipping and said so, but then it wasn't very long before he began to develop instead a, a kind of a latest in self-assurance. And then it became apparent that he was really losing his experience altogether. The next thing he began, he became concerned about the uh, safety and security of the treasury and the movement and so forth. And he became more and more worried about this and began to travel extensively throughout Australia, campaigning for a return to a very strict control system of organisation. He wanted me brought under control of a committee, so I went where the committee said and did what the committee, committee told me to do. The committee would um, take over the treasury and make sure the money was correctly spent and so forth and so on and so on. And I saw in this a betrayal of the very things he'd stood for and accepted just about eight years before. Now, I followed my usual practice um, of not fighting against him, I didn't go to war over the situation, I simply left him to do what he felt he had to do and went about my work leaving the problem of solving this thing entirely and completely in God's hands. I've come to learn and I'd like to stress this point that this movement is not mine, it's God's and God is, God is his defender. I remember I was at A.T. Noah Dobinier in his, in his book The Reformation in England made the point that when Henry VIII named himself as the defender of the faith, in fact if you, uh, I think it's still on English coins, and um, I think it's an English coin still, that the Queen is a defender of the faith, and the Bignet said that this was usurping God's position because God is a defender of the faith, not us. And so I made no attempt to um, counter the work of Charlie Moore. I just left him go amongst the believers and left, left him with the complete freedom to hear what he had to say. And he had a lot to say, believe me, about my character, amongst other things. You can always rely. One thing you can rely on every time, it never misses. When a person comes levelling accusation at another person, he is a servant of Satan. It doesn't matter how pious they may look, how dedicated they may seem to be, how hard working, how high in your esteem they may previously have been held, when they start to level accusations they have joined the band of him who is called the accuser of the brethren. And one thing that no Christian should ever do, or two things we should never do, is one, become a counter-accuser, and number two, spend time defending your good name. It might be very good anyway, but have a good about me, but don't defend it. I've always been greatly impressed by the statement uh, in Volume 3 of the Testimonies where Sister White was given a vision and in this vision she saw the people of God uh, advancing along under God's leadership and behind them, following them, <coughs> pardon me, were a number of people that um, were hurling black balls after them and she, she saw that if the, um, the children of God were to turn around and try and fend off these black balls 
The result was that they would then find their clothing being marked and dirty and besmirched by the boars, whereas they ignored them, even though the boars struck them, they fell to the ground leaving no mark whatsoever. I'm just, I'm just trying to find, but I just didn't see it in the index to volume 3, but it's in volume 3 of the testimony somewhere. If you look at black balls in the big uh, three volume index, you'll find it for sure. And, um, uh, come right. And then she asked, what did, this, what did this all mean? And Sister I was told by the angel that the black balls were the true and false stories told about the people of God. You know, God's folk do make mistakes. We do get ourselves in some tangles sometimes. And people looking on, of course, often form their own opinions of what may be a very innocent action upon our part. And um, consequently, the, um, the black boys were, were all these slanderous things said about them. And if the people of God try to defend their good name and answer these charges, then they only made matters worse. The accusations stuck and uh, their reputations were tarnished. But if they completely ignored the black balls and went about the work God had given them to do, then the stories uh, fizzled out and had no evil effect upon the work of God in any sense whatsoever. It's a lesson well worth learning, believe me. And so when Charlie Moon began to circulate around the field, I let him do it. I didn't make any attempt to follow after him to counter his work. I went on with what I had to do. I had my orders and I carried them out and left him completely in God's care. <coughs> Now at this point I'd like to, um, well just a minute, I'll go ahead just a little bit further before I make, make that point. Now my work of course involves some visitation around the field which was not influenced by his activities, I just carried it as normal. And uh, as usual I planned to get into Grafton and visit the believers there and go on to Sydney and visit them and come home again. I went to Grafton and uh, talked to the folk there with the usual, with, with a little batch of Bible studies and nice fellowship. And then on, I think it was probably Sunday morning and Monday morning after the weekend was over, I boarded a, a commercial flight to fly from Grafton to Sydney to spend the next several days with the believers down there. And this problem of Charlie Moore was somewhat on my mind and I asked God for his answer to the problem. Because I have found that uh, every time a crisis has overtaken this movement, God has given us a very beautiful answer to it. And the answer has exactly met our needs. I say exactly met our needs. And I happen to have with me a book I don't read very often, namely Acts of the Apostles. I'm not saying it's a bad book, it's an extremely good book. Well worth a lot more re reading than I give it, give it. Especially as we're facing our rerun of that history in the coming loud cry period. And uh, I more or less um, opened the book at random. I wanted to do some spiritual reading on the plane. I wasn't thinking in terms of searching for an answer. When I opened at random at the chapter entitled um, Paul a Prisoner, beginning on page 400 of the book um, Acts of the Apostles, or is it 399? It's 399 to be more exact. Now, if you read the Sabbath rest book carefully, you'll, you'll remember the chapter in there entitled, um, what's it called again? But it, it, does, it does go through this chapter on Paul a prisoner. What's that chapter called? Uh, Problems in the Early Church. It's called in the book God's Sabbath Rest. And assuming and hoping that you've all read the book carefully through at least once and hopefully several times, I won't uh, detail this, this chapter as closely as I might, but I'll just run through it quickly and give the main high points to it. The chapter opens with Paul's last return from, uh, I should mention as I read this chapter through, I saw with, a, with, with tremendous clarity that we were actually reliving the experience of which Paul went back there in the early church. That the same things were happening as it happened back there and I knew exactly what I must do as I read of the mistake that Paul himself made. I don't condemn Paul for one moment. If I'd been back in his shoes I would have done the same thing, no doubt especially if I had as great a heart of love and compassion as he had, which I certainly don't. And, but, but having seen what Paul did and the outcome of his um, sincere but mistaken course of action, I have, no, I have no excuse for doing the same thing as he did. And therefore his story becomes of very great value to us in these latter days. Now the story back there as you trace to this chapter, and I'll do it quite briefly I think this morning, is as follows. <coughs> 
it, it begins with uh, Paul's return to Jerusalem after his last missionary journey where Paul found a spirit of um, coldness and inability to appreciate the spirit which motivated the self-sacrificing believers out in, in the Gentile mission field. And then Sister White goes back to trace the development of that spirit. And she begins then with that point of time when they had come out of the Jewish church the cross is behind them, the ascension of Christ is behind them, the latter rain has fallen upon them, the latter rain, and the movement has become a well-defined structure. Now, there were, well, practically everyone in the movement had come out of the Jewish church organisation. And we know the old story where we're warned that old habits strive for the mastery. And the only kind of church organisation I'd ever known, ever experienced, ever worked with was the Jewish church organisation and what kind of structure is that? Man over man in the place of God is papal through and through. So what was the natural tendency of these men to do or to introduce them to the Jewish, into, into the Christian church? The kind of organisation which they knew. And so Sister White writes about them on page 400 in the book Acts of the Apostles it says, in their anxiety, or I should go back a little further I think, some of the leading men of Jerusalem cling to former prejudices and habits of thought had not cooperated heartily with Paul and his associates. So what was striving for the mastery? Old habits. Old habits of thought, old habits of behaviour. In their anxiety to preserve a few meaningless forms and ceremonies they had lost sight of the blessing that would come to them and to the cause they loved to an effort to, to unite in one all parts of the Lord's work now through an effort to unite in one now who is the one in whom they must unite Jesus Christ he's the head and therefore the only possible true basis for unity was for them to come into line with God's principles of divine order in the church of God it goes on to say, although desirous of safeguarding the best interests of the Christian church. Now they desire to safeguard the best interests of the Christian church. Now what appearance would that uh, desire give to them? What appearance? Would they look like being genuine, concerned Christians? Absolutely. Would they look like being the most responsible and uh, dependable men in the church? Absolutely. Would they look like being, being godly men? Absolutely. And this of course makes the test that much harder for people to bear and we have to look beyond the sincerity of a person, his genuineness, his good behaviour to the, to the real nature of the mission. That is the test. What is the message that man is supporting? That's the real test. Not, uh, not what his good behaviour might lead you to think about him instead. So they were although desirous of safeguarding the best interests of the Christian church, they had failed to keep step with the advancing provinces of God and in their human wisdom, in their what kind of wisdom? Human wisdom attempted to throw about work as some many unnecessary restrictions. Thus there arose a group of men who were unacquainted with unacquainted personally with the changing circumstances and peculiar needs met by labourers in distant fields. And note this next bit, yet who insisted that they had the authority to direct their brethren in these fields to follow certain specified methods of labour. They felt as if the work of preaching the gospel should be carried forward in harmony with their opinions. Now this is natural, we're not to be surprised about this because that's what they came from, an old habit strive for the mastery. Now the situation was not so critical in our movement but the same pattern was there. We all came out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We'd only known one kind of church organisation. We never even questioned that kind of church organisation and we naturally tended to establish the same thing in our midst back in the early 60s. Now then, God in his great love would not let this situation pass without doing something to correct it. And as we know, there shortly came the great council at Jerusalem when James was the chairman apparently. Peter and Paul were present and the scripture says there was much disputing and much disputing of course is indicative of men trying to force their ideas against the ideas being being forced by other men so it's a face-to-face -face contention between human ideas, differing human ideas 
and the situation was, was turned about by Peter standing up and saying in effect men and brethren he says what is all the argument about the Holy Spirit has already spoken on this subject he's made his declaration by pouring his spirit upon the Gentile believers as much as on the, on the Christian upon, upon the Jewish believers and the Spirit makes the distinction so why do we make a distinction and all you've got to do Peter said is to accept the voice of God and do what he says and that was so logical so obviously true that everybody there apparently the very last person accepted the counsel given by Peter and men were turned from their ideas to listen to the voice of God let him be the plan maker and when they obeyed the voice of God unity came in amongst those people now this had a double blessing first of all it united the church but secondly it opened the eyes of these of this ruling class to see that they had been making a bad mistake as I read now on page 401 although those present at this meeting were, among those present at this meeting were some who had severely criticised the methods of labour followed by the, by the apostles upon whom rested the chief burden of carrying the gospel to the Gentile world but during the council their views of God's purpose had broadened and they had united with their brethren in making wise decisions which made possible the unification of the entire body of believers they made wise decisions which made possible the unification of the entire body of believers now what's the only type of decision which will unify the believers under these circumstances the decision to step out of the position of being a head or a subhead or any kind of head and give that position back to Jesus Christ how else could they make decisions that would unify the believers? They couldn't. So then, this corresponds to our 1966 uh, event in Australia when we recognised that we were stepping into God's place by introducing the voting system or having introduced it and we made the wise decision to step out of that position and give back to God the headship of the movements. It was, it was an exact counterpart the same kind of development remember of course Sister Wise says that in Great Controversy page 343 that uh, there was a striking similarity between every great religious uh, movement and God's dealings with men are ever the same and so on and, and the movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past well here's another very very striking parallel that uh, is very important to us to understand today now the result of this move was, was great prosperity in the church of God and so it was now movement too doors opened in every direction and the movement began to go forward very strongly as Sister White says afterward when it became apparent that the converts among the Gentiles were increasing rapidly there were a few of the leading brethren of Jerusalem who began to cherish and knew their former prejudices against the methods of Paul and his associates all right, so now we find a sad reversion. Here was this great council in Jerusalem which um, changed the whole structure of the church's organisation and introduced great prosperity. But then afterwards came this reversion and when it did there were a few of the brethren who began to cherish and knew their former prejudices against the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And these prejudices became so strong that, that the following developments took place. I'll read them now these prejudices strengthened with the passing of the years until some of the leaders determined that the work of preaching the gospel must henceforth be conducted in accordance with their own ideas if Paul would conform his methods to certain policy which they advocated they would acknowledge and sustain his work otherwise they could no longer look upon with favour or grant it their support now they'd gone back until they were as bad as the church from which they had come just as bad and there's no excuse for this whatsoever in fact um, if they'd been careful, thoughtful, truly responsible men they would have said now alright back there in Jerusalem the Holy Spirit spoke to us we obeyed his voice and the result of that obedience was prosperity for the church now above all, above all else you want a prosperous church so therefore if that procedure brought prosperity let's stick to the procedure but there was a factor which you must not overlook the prosperity of the church was now threatened by persecution the preaching of Paul in that he was calling upon the abandonment of the sacrificial system the ceremonial system 
were threatening to generate tremendous anger in the hearts of the Pharisees who were fanatically devoted to that sacrificial system and the church of course was threatened with persecution and those leaders in Jerusalem became more concerned about what they feared would happen to the church more concerned about results and consequences they were about obeying God and so instead of confining themselves to two questions what is God's command and what are his promises they, they began to explore the question what are the consequences of what Paul is doing and as, sure, and as surely as the consequences were not very attractive they felt that they had to take over the work of God and do so and remove those consequences that is to minimize the prospect of persecution what they should have said simply was this Paul is a member such as we are he is answerable only to the head Jesus Christ he is not answerable to us his head Jesus Christ has appointed him a work to do a powerful message of preaching to the Gentile world and calling upon men to give up the old ceremonial system if that's what God has given Paul to do we don't care what the consequences may be Paul must do what God has given him to do and we must lead him to do it and our responsibility of course is by our prayers and by our financial support to ensure that he is unhindered and totally supported in that work and if they had taken that attitude they would have maintained the lesson which they had been taught away back here but they showed they would forgotten the lesson now that's tragic and may it never be written of us that we've forgotten one lesson God has taught us may there never be any backtracking in our part as there wasn't a part of these religious leaders back there in Jerusalem now exactly as those men reverted back to where they'd come from so Charlie Morgan and the four other people who stood with him and he had, he had four supporters Glacina Ferguson, Jack Spleeman, his own wife and, and a woman named uh, Mrs. Woolrich um, and um, they had reverted right back to where they'd come from and they showed that they needed to learn the lesson all over again or if they wouldn't learn the lesson all over again to suffer separation from God's people now then <clears throat> just as a confrontation was coming up in Paul's day so a confrontation was coming up in our day back in 1974 or was it, I think it was 74 or it could be 75 now when Paul arrived in Jerusalem as you read in Acts the 23rd chapter the brethren uh, with their minds preoccupied with this persecution problem this persecution threat and humanly seeking for a human solution to the problem and desperately determined to preserve the safety and security of the church said to Paul we have this problem now to solve it do this that we say unto you what significant words they were on their part that's the exact words in scripture in Acts the 23rd chapter do this that we say unto you that's the worst thing they could have said isn't it the very worst thing they should have said Paul you must do what God tells you to do nothing else but that but they said no do what we say unto you now why did Paul do it because as Sister White says he cherished he was terribly burdened he, he was terribly frustrated and concerned by the disunity that there was in the church he longed to be one with his brethren he hated this division which was there and he loved and respected those leaders in Jerusalem and longed indeed to to come into harmony with them so he thought maybe if I just make a little concession maybe if I just demonstrate to these fellow I'm not stubborn and, and difficult maybe they'll come the other half of the road and join with me they weren't prepared to come at all now I've made the point before that um, the procedure by which Peter and the other apostles selected Matthias to take the place of the dead Judas was an affront to God and Matthias in no sense of the word was the twelfth apostle to take the place of Judas that Paul was that man but God's selection of Paul in the face of their selection of Matthias was something which must have been a stinging rebuke to those apostles and church leaders and the fact that Paul never seemed to have full recognition by the church probably, probably stems from the way in which uh, they went ahead and chose a man of their own choosing instead of the man of God's choosing what they ought to have done of course was to they should never have appointed Matthias they should have remembered how that uh, Christ had called 11 of them and those 11 had been faithful despite, the, despite their fearful temptation they had called one of them the one whom they had called had gone bad 
have betrayed their Lord in the most disgraceful and shocking manner and surely they ought to have learnt their lesson once and for all time but they exhibited that common human frailty of not learning the lesson on a permanent basis. I think of how many times God came to Israel and tried to teach them the same lesson over and over and over again that they just wouldn't learn. They just wouldn't learn. We have to learn the first time round. No second and third time, but the first time round. And they should have simply said, well, we'll just wait until God appoints a replacement for Judas. That's his business, not ours. And left it at that. But when they went ahead and, and appointed their own nominee for the position and put him in that position where God had never recognised him, then when God brought his man along, Paul had difficulty throughout the rest of his life being recognised by the church. So all these problems go right back to failures on the church to walk with God from the very first instance. And so Paul made the mistake then of uh, exceeding, of bending, of uh, taking a step in their direction, of letting them take take, uh, the place of God over him. And when Paul did that, when he bent to human pressure, what was the consequence? He lost his freedom. The church was deprived of its champion for the, for the, for the mystery of God. The, the champions of the mystery of iniquity were then left in control of the church and the inevitable consequence was the building of the Dark Ages. Millions of precious souls dying in ignorance and despair when the church of God ought already to have been in the kingdom of heaven. Now as I rode that plane down to Sydney and read this chapter and all this and I saw with, with the sharpest clarity that we were, we, were, we, were, we were reliving that history. And the same pressure that had been brought to me as, upon me has been brought upon Paul. I knew what I had to do. I had, I had no, no doubts about it. I knew that even if the entire church forsook the truth of God and left me standing completely alone, I must not under any circumstances obey the voice of men who said to me, Do this that we say unto you. As Christ alone must remain in my head, and I must calmly but firmly stand for that principle no matter what the cost may be. And I did. And the outcome was incredible, as I shall tell you in the next study period, as this one now is altogether gone. I will say in closing, though, that as I approached the, the conference, which we'll talk about in the next study period, I approached it absolutely convinced that Charlie Morgan had, the, had, had all the believers by the ears. He had their loyalty that they're going to come and that... Uh, there would be a resounding acclamation for his principles and my work has come to its end. I was quite convinced about, about that. But nonetheless, I determined not to yield and I would quietly present the position and the believers could make up their minds without any pressure from me whatsoever. It was really living out the Sabbath with principles in the strongest possible way and the victory which was gained surprised me and still surprises me, but I'm very, very grateful for it. And that was the greatest crisis this church ever faced and I'm glad to say that we did come out very much on the right side of it as I went around the world and uh, reported to the believers in every land the, the principles, they were received very, very well and the church has been operating by those principles ever since and since that time the greatest and most wonderful revelation of truth have come to us, the Sabbath rest, God's character and so on and the church has grown to its largest and most biggest proportions. The time is gone, so I'll stop at that point and we'll pick up this theme again when we meet again at uh, 15 minutes past 11. Now, a suggestion has been aired this morning that you might like to give ear to and perhaps join in with. There's an extremely beautiful park just up the road here. You've been, some of you have already been there. And the suggestion is that we carry our lunch up there and uh, enjoy it together in that uh, beautiful area. I didn't pick it up. I'll give the credit to somebody else.